What an honor, what an absolute honor to be able to bring this message today. <clears throat> I said in an earlier presentation that um, when I first gave my life to Christ, I, uh, the Lord put a real burden on my heart to find the gospel. Because I was so disappointed with what everybody was telling me the gospel was. Um, the Spirit really put it on my heart. That it was just unsatisfactory. Um, Jesus died for our sins. That's it. There's got this. I mean, we're talking about the king of the universe here. Surely there's going to be something more to it. And when I was presented, when I was taught this truth, it changed my life and it brought all the answers between the relationship of the law and and um is it not on technology definitely a love-hate relationship here but anyway back to what i was saying this this message answered all the questions between calvinism and arianism and all of the different branches and the evangelical gospel and the gospel that God raised up in 1888 for us to give, the true gospel and its relationship with the law and justification and the predestination of humanity. It all comes together in this truth. But it's probably something that you likely have not heard before. In America, we have a very egocentric mindset. It's all about me and us and like my relationship with Jesus and, and, and a corporate mindset is very void from the American mindset, but it, it is an Eastern mindset. <clears throat> so we're going to have to put our thinking caps on, allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us. Don't take my word for it. Study this out yourself. This, this message today, in my opinion, is the most important message about the gospel because it explains all the nuts and bolts of how God saved us how he made us righteous, how he justified us. This is the science of the message, so let's get started. There's a lot of debate, a lot of bickering about the gospel, and it comes down to an understanding of objective and subjective. Does everybody know the difference between objective and subjective? Yes. No. So objective is, is a fact. It has nothing to do with you. But the subjective is my experience. Let's go through this. Objective is a true or false, false statement. Subjective is our personal experience or feelings with something. So if I said fish swim, that would be an objective statement. It's a true statement. Fish taste good. Now that's a subjective statement. Some people don't like fish. Some people do. Pigs can fly. Is this an objective statement or a subjective statement? Subjective. Objective, because it's either true or false. Pigs can fly. Chocolate's good. Is this objective or subjective? Subjective. subjective. That's absolutely correct. Is God real? Is this an objective statement? Or a subjective statement? Objective. objective. Objective statement. God is real. This is an objective statement. And he is a personal God. He's not some person way off in the distance that has nothing to do with us. He walks and talks with us every day if we listen. So here are some, and you should have all these in your notes. All of the scriptures I use in the entire presentation should be. So here are some scriptures about objective and subjective facts of the gospel. And I find a lot of times that a lot of the arguments that happen about the gospel is they're simple, simply arguing an objective side or a subjective side. Both are true. Both are true. So what we're going to be talking about today is the objective message of the gospel. It doesn't have to do with our reaction to it, our participation to it. It has nothing to do with the subjective reality of the gospel. This is totally objective, what we read today. If you remember, um, a couple of weeks ago I said, chapter 5, Romans is one, of the, is one of the main books for the gospel. It was Paul's thesis, right? And he wrote it to a Roman church that he had never been there first to preach the gospel. 
So when we go to the gospel, when we go to a book to find the gospel, Romans is the best one because he hadn't ever preached it. So he gives it in its raw form. <clears throat> and chapter 5 is the most important chapter, and that's the chapter that we will be hubbing off of. So Paul was knocked off of his high horse. Um, you can, you can kind of say he was a, a zealot, equal to a zealot, what we consider a zealot today. He was out to sabotage the church, absolutely, 100%. He wanted to destroy it and arrest everybody. But as what happens should happen to all of us when we meet Jesus, he knocks us off our high horse. And he instructed Ananias to go and to talk to him. Well, Ananias was terrified, right? We know who this man is. But Jesus said, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. So it was his chosen instrument to proclaim and to teach the gospel. It says in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, called as an apostle. Who was he called by? He wasn't called by man. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, not by man. It says in Galatians 1, 11 and 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ himself. Remember, he says, oh, we'll get there. In 2 Corinthians 12, 3 and 4, Paul, talking about himself, says, whether I was in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but I was caught up to paradise and I heard inexpressible things. He is going to try to teach us. In Isaiah 42, 9, it says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. They're gone and done away with. A new things I declare. So let's open up our hearts to receive maybe a different perspective of the gospel that we had never thought of. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation in Christ. This concept of in Christ is so pivotal of actually being in him, in his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Desire of Ages says, and the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is simply my, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative with all our sins and weakness. We are not cast aside as worthless. He hath made us acceptable in the beloved. Ephesians 1 6. The glory that rests upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. Notice this reoccurring theme in him, in him. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, any one of the three angels, as a matter of fact, if any one of the angels' messages contradict, should preach a gospel other than the one that we are preaching to you, let him be under a curse. None of God's angels None of God's beings will ever give a message contrary to the true gospel that Paul was teaching. This is the heart of the three angels' messages. This is the heart of it. On the day when God will judge the secrets of men according to my gospel, Paul says in Romans 2.16. He's going to judge the secrets of men through his gospel. So we should probably be pretty familiar with what this is that we're going to be judged through. Paul wrote most of the epistles, and we can glean a lot of great information. So in wrote Ephesians 3, 1, 11, For this reason I, Paul, be a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, 
Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. So this was a mystery that was made known to him by revelation. As I have already written briefly in reading this, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Obviously speaking about Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. He has already spoken of that, which we'll get to. And it continues. Which was not made known to people in other generations as it has been revealed by the Spirit of God to his holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and share together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of the Lord's people, that his grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches in Christ and to make plain to everyone the administrations of this mystery which for the ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Now that doesn't mean it's not in the Old Testament, but it wasn't revealed the way that it was revealed to the apostles and specifically Paul. Continuing in Ephesians 3. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifest wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities of the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul has revealed this doctrine in Christ as the mystery of Christ and wants to make it known plainly, right? In Christ. This is actually Paul's main theological point, the theme that runs through the New and the Old Testament. And the phrases that Paul uses a lot are not identical. So he uses in the Christ, in Christ Jesus, in the Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord, in the Lord, in God, in the God, in Him, in whom, in Jesus. There are many ways where he expresses this idea. And as a matter of fact, if you go through, I did, I went through my entire New Testament, and I marked up every place where Paul's referring to, and Jesus, referring to in Christ, this in Christ idea. And as you can see, it's, it's clearly all through the theme of these first couple of chapters. But if you go to 4 to 6, he doesn't mention it at all, because it's the foundation, it's the objective reality that brings us into subjective relationship with him. So the, the in Christ has... It does have to do with the subjective. It gets you to the subjective, but he's not mentioning it here. There's a distinction. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. When we understand this thing, this thing that I'm going to try to share with you, the veil will be removed and we will see the gospel and what it said, what it means much more clearly. So if we wanted to study creation, where would we go? We'd go to Genesis. Obviously, creation is spoken of in a lot of other books. So we would go to those other books also. But the main hub of where we would study creation would be in Genesis. What about prophecy? Well, you can find prophecy all through the Bible, but clearly Daniel and Revelation have a special, very significant role. Where do we want to go if we want to study the life of Jesus? The Gospels, right? Obviously. Where do we want to go when we want to study the Gospel? Romans and, and Paul. Paul was really the champion of that. And this concept of in Christ is the hub of... Of the gospel. It is the very centerpiece, and everything comes off of this. So, in order to kind of understand this, think about a woman who's carrying a baby. The baby is separate from the woman, but it is inside the woman. So, anything the mother does affects this child. If the mother eats a bunch of really good, healthy food, this will impact that baby. 
Did that baby choose to eat that food? No. No. Had no choice in the matter at all. But it affects the baby nonetheless. But if the mother chooses to eat all kinds of bad food, again, the child has no say in this decision, but it directly affects the child. If the mother go, gets on a plane and goes from one country to another, is that child traveling from one country to another? Yes. yes. It is not doing it, but because it's in the mother and the mother's doing it, the child is implicated. So if there's a plane wreck and the mother dies, what happens to the child? The child dies. If the mother goes to jail, where's the baby go? The baby goes to jail. Everything that happens to the mother affects the baby because the baby was in the mother. And this is what Romans 5 teaches us is that just as all humanity was in Adam, in his loins, in the DNA, therefore his condemnation spread to all humanity. And as we read, the same exact thing happens in Christ. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, no choice in the matter, for if by the offense of the one, the many die, for on the one hand, the judgment rose from one offense, resulting in condemnation. For if by the offense of the one, death reigned through the one, so then, as through one offense, the result was condemnation to all humanity. Because in Adam, Humanity, in a way, obviously not in a feminine way, but in Adam and Eve, all humanity existed. Acts 17.26, for by one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, right? Romans 5.18, consequently, just as, now this just as is referring to the one Adam that brought condemnation. So in that same manner, one trespass resulted in condemnation to all people. Also, so also, the one righteous act, Christ's life, resulted in justification and life for all people. God predestined all humanity to be with him. He didn't choose one little select of people and then ostracize all other people because he has the power to do that. That's, that's not what the gospel teaches us. In Adam all died. Now, this is a biblical truth. If we go back to Genesis 25, 23, we can see there was a mother and she had twins and they were fighting obnoxiously enough that she had to go to the Lord and say, what is going on? And the Lord said, there are two nations in your womb, not people, two nations because those people in them represented the entire nation that would then come from them. Same thing in Hebrews. Paul, I believe Paul, so I believe Paul wrote Hebrews originally in Aramaic and it was translated into Greek and that's where the confusion comes from. It's clearly his theology of the in Christ is found all the way through it. But it's a little muddled and so I believe he originally wrote it in Aramaic, which makes sense because it was to the Hebrews. And then it was translated from there into the Greek, and that's where we get some questions. But in Hebrews 7, 4 through 7, see how great this man, Melchizedek, was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, he gave a tenth of the spoils, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a um, commandment in the law to take tithes, from the people, it is from their brothers, through these also are descended from Abraham. So Melchizedek got tithes from Abraham, even though Levi was in him, and Levi was commanded by the law to receive tithes. Paul goes on and says, But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descendants from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him. Who had the promises? It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior, right? So if Melchizedek was receiving tithes from Abraham, 
and blessed him, then that means that the priesthood of Melchizedek was higher than Abraham, right? Because he was receiving the tithes and Melchizedek was giving the blessing, right? That's what Paul's, that's what Paul's saying here. The creator God bless you, right? And then Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. Back to Hebrews 7. It says, one might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he, Levi, was still in his loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Right? So, so are, you, are you getting what Paul is saying? The tribe of Levi existed in Abraham before it existed. Therefore, that tribe of people were actually paying tithes to Melchizedek, which meant the priesthood of Melchizedek was bigger than the priesthood of the Levites. Does that make sense, what Paul's trying to bring out here? But there's also the corporate, the fact that Levi was in his ancestry, and he did the thing that his ancestor did. Does that make sense? Are you, are you lost? Are you with me still? So let's try to go over this again. Okay, Levi paid tithe and received a blessing from Melchizedek in Abraham. Blessings and payments. So the baby of Levi in Abraham was making payments and being blessed by Melchizedek. So in Romans 5.18, Ephesians 2.10, 1 Corinthians 1.30 are just three places that clearly talks about us all in Christ. So you all are created in Christ Jesus. And actually 1 Corinthians 30, which we'll get to, says that we are in him by the Father. The second mankind, the second Adam, right? <clears throat> Ephesians 2.10, for we are created in Christ Jesus. And this goes on to say, to do good works which were prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. So the righteousness that we are to walk in is already done. It's already completed in Christ. For by his Father's doing, you all are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Ephesians 1.4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. All the nations of the world in Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation to all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Now, I like to, this isn't necessarily a biblical fact, although I believe it's true. One of the ways that I like to try to explain this is the human body has trillions of cells. It's not beyond God to put every single person who has ever existed DNA strand into a single cell in his entire body. So his entire body shared the DNA strands of all humans. Of course, it could have been the original DNA. Uh, there's lots of different ways that he can do it. But I, I believe that this is a, a good way to try to understand what Paul is saying here. That you, your DNA, your existence was literally in Christ. Literally. We also find this in the Old Testament. So this isn't something that's new or fanciful. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So we have the likeness here of the woman, which is obviously it's Eve, but it's also of the church. It's of a multitude of people. And it's also referenced into his seed, singular. So we have a singular reference and also the multitude reference. We go into Genesis 12, 3. And God says to Abraham, In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When Gabriel came, he said to the shepherds, I share good news of great joy for all mankind, for all people, right? For all the land, in Genesis 13, 15, For all the land which you see, I give to you and your seed, singular, forever. And I will make your seed, singular, as plentiful as the dust of the earth. So this singular seed will be as, as much as the dust of the earth. For anyone who can count the dust of the earth, then your seed could also be counted. Clearly the scriptures are bringing together this concept of from a singular person, there will be a multitude. In Isaiah... 
this is actually one of the reasons why they can uh, the Jews can dismiss dismiss Isaiah 53 because earlier in the chapter it talks about the nation of Israel being the servant so it waffles back and forth in Isaiah from being a single servant to being a nation of servants right so here in 43 10 and 11 you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant from whom I chose, so that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Okay, I just want to pause. Jehovah Witnesses like to say a lot. They use this. They, they like have really taken this verse for themselves, right, that they are the witnesses. But then when you bring into John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says that there was the word, and he was with God, and he was God. They say, oh, well, he's a little God. He was created after. <laughs> well, this verse right here, let me see. Before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. Okay, we'll just go right on. I only, I am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. So this is talking about the nation of, of Israel being the witnesses. But when we get to Isaiah 53, behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant will justify the many. So we have, again, we have this connection between the singular connected to a multitude. Matthew 25, 41 says that he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, unto eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Fire was never intended for us. It was intended for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, 34, he says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who were blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you for you from the foundation of the world. This in Christ was the concept, it was the plan from the very beginning. He predestined all humanity. Our purified good works of love all stem from him. For we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that now we should walk in them. This is where the rubber meets the road. Now that's the subjective. Now, I'm touching on the subjective part of the in Christ. In Christ leads to our works of perfect love. So it is the, it is the hub, and our works are part of a spoke, right? It says in Isaiah 42, 6, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you, and I will give you a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. In Psalms 46 and 8, it says, In sacrifice and offerings you have not delighted, but you have given me... It's, it, it's interesting because the Hebrew says, An open ear. But in Hebrews, it says, A body you have prepared for me, which actually comes from the Septuagint. So if you go to the Septuagint of the Old Testament, it says, A body you have prepared for me, which tells me conclusively that when Paul wrote Hebrews or whoever... He was quoting the Septuagint, not the Hebrew. But then the Aramaic comes in and adds a little bit of nuance to the to the ear opened. The word used there is pierced in the in the Aramaic. Your ear you have pierced, you have opened, pierced, which brings my mind back to the servant in the law. If he wanted to permanently serve, his ear was pierced. And so I think that that's actually a connection to Christ. Submitting himself to being his permanent ser servant in, in the flesh, right? But a burnt offering and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written within my heart. The new covenant first had to take place in Christ. Christ was the promise of the new covenant. <coughs> this new covenant is one of the spokes. In Matthew 4, 11, 1 through 11, Jesus is being tempted. He was tempted at all points and even shed his own blood. But when he was tempted, he kept faith. He kept perfect faith. Our flawed faith cannot save us. But Christ's 
perfect faith in the word of God and the Father is what saves us. It says in 1 Timothy 1.14, The grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This faith and this love is found in this hub, in Christ. Romans 3.31 do we then do away with the law? By this faith. Now this is a poorly translated verse. But by this faith, do, does this faith, does the faith, Christ's faith, does it do away with the law? On the contrary, most translations say we uphold the law. But the we is italicized. The we is not in the Greek. Is what it actually is referring to in, in the structure of the sentence, in the Greek structure, is the faith. The faith is the, is the subject of the sentence. So do we then nullify the law by the faith? No, on the contrary, it, the faith, kept the law. How ridiculous is it to think that the law has been done away with when the standard was kept by our Savior? He kept it perfectly. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of of Jesus. Now the King James does a grand slam with the faith of Jesus on this. All the other translations just totally baffles it. This is always the faith of Christ referred to. Romans 3.21 says the righteousness of God which is by the faith of Jesus Christ to this faith of Christ is being imparted to all upon them that believe. So our belief makes it available for Christ to give us his faith. And then we can walk in victory through his faith and his victory. So the faith of Christ comes out of this concept of in Christ. Melchizedek, by the translation of this name, is the king of righteousness, and he's also the king of Salem, which means the king of peace. Jesus is the king of righteousness. So when the law was given, if you go back and you actually read um, as, as Exodus 19, you'll see that God never wanted Israel to go into the old covenant, the covenant of their obedience. He wanted them to enter into the promise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their response was, everything you tell us, we will do. We'll make sure we're going to get it done. Well, the whole point was, when you see somebody walking in the perfect obedience of the law, you can know that's your king of righteousness. It was a prophecy to show us who the real righteous one was and our king of peace. Right? Isaiah 53 11 says, in Christ, or yeah, in Christ is not just theology. It's about the life of a real person. And it is so important to receive this because it's so easy, at least it is for me, to get into the theological points. And to disconnect it from the actual man and person that is saving me. It's not just a theology. This is the person of Jesus Christ who walked in perfect righteousness. Isaiah 53 says, Let out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see us and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. By his righteousness, we are righteous. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, unless heaven and earth pass away, not, a, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever nullifies one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus and the gospel did not do away with. It did not erase the law. It fulfilled it. He says to John, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Right? So when Christ was being Baptized, he was being baptized for all humanity. So when the thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me, he didn't have to get off the cross and be baptized. Christ's baptism was given to him. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city 
to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now it's interesting that a lot of translations have to put in the holy place, they have to put place here, because they don't understand that this is about Jesus being baptized by the Holy Spirit and Him being the most holy. 4 BC says, whatever virtue humanity possesses, it possesses only in Christ Jesus. First Selected Messages says, we are to be found in Him, not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness which is in Christ. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other, to prepare the way of the Lord. Is my righteousness that I'm walking in supposed to be preached? Look at how wonderful I'm being. No, this is the righteousness of Christ that should be sounded to the earth, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. For what the law was powerless to do because of the weakness of flesh, so God did what the law could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and to condemn sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. So the righteousness of Christ comes off of this in Christ hub. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become our righteousness, our holiness or sanctification, and our redemption. Christ has become our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Is there anything else? Anything he's leaving out? He is everything to us. He is everything. From in Christ comes our holiness. In him, Colossians 2.10, in him. You have been made complete. You're not complete in yourself. I don't keep the Sabbath perfectly. Jesus did. He kept it perfectly. And I can now possess that perfect righteousness by faith. By faith. <clears throat> once, we are, once we were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because... Your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you in Christ's physical body. Could this get any more, like, plain? He reconciled us in the physical body of Christ through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blame, without blemish, and free from accusation. You know how many Christians run around pointing their finger, accusation? This person's doing this sin and they're not saved. And this person's doing this sin and they're not saved. Christ has made us free from accusation. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't uphold the truth. And we shouldn't lift up the truth. And we shouldn't declare the truth. But we must be careful to not become the accuser of the brethren. Amen. You all are in Christ. You know, there's a saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself. One of the things I love about God, I love about God, is he, he has me participate in so much stuff. I feel like, so many times, I feel like God's carrying a bag of groceries, and I'm like, and I'm carrying it with him, and he's just letting me take the glory for carrying this bag when he's got it the whole time. Well, in this particular case, he didn't do that. He came and he did it himself. Or do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning her husband. So then... If while her husband is alive, she gives herself to another man, she will be called an adulterer. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. So that she is not 
an adulteress if she gives herself to another man. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you, not the law, you also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Christ. Do you understand how significant this is? What's the punishment for sin? Death. Death. You died in Christ. So when Christ was dying on the cross, you were in him. So the law says, if you disobey me, you must die. And now I can say, I have. You have no more jurisdiction over me because I have died. But it gets better. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. What does justified mean? First of all, this is a, this is a legal term. So what does the word justified mean? What was that? Just as I, if I had never sinned. Complete pardon. Yeah, I like, I like just if I had never sinned. So we have, not only do we have his righteousness, but through the death, right, all the law has been paid for. So we've been justified. It has been fulfilled. The law's requirement of death wasn't done away with. He fulfilled it. One, and it says in 2 Corinthians 5.14 and Hebrews 2.9, one died for all, so all died. All died in Christ. Review and Harold, what is righteousness? It is the satisfaction that Christ gave the divine law in our behalf. So our death is found in Christ. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in your trespasses. It was by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up in Christ Jesus. Now this is the part that I absolutely love. Because if God raised humanity up in Christ, and he purchased through that work, he purchased the resurrection to humanity, would only the saved be resurrected? No. no, everybody gets a resurrection. But what does Paul say? For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die. So also in Christ all will be made alive, but each to his own order, because now we have a choice as to which resurrection we want to take part in. Which resurrection do we want to be in? Do we want to be in the resurrection of life? Do we want to believe this? Or is it too good to be true? No, it's too good to be true. So the resurrection comes from in Christ. And he has seated us with him in heaven in Christ Jesus. This always puzzled me. This always puzzled me until this dawned on me that I am actually in Christ. And that's how I'm seated. He has eternally connected himself to me. He is eternally my brother, my flesh and blood. 2 Corinthians 1.20 All the promises of God are yes. Where are they yes? In Christ. Not in my words, not in my failures. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. Such a beautiful truth. Ephesians 2.13 But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, king of peace, who has made the two groups one, and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He's made these two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, one because he was all humanity. He did this by ending the law of commandments expressed in decrees. He made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles and created in himself one new people from the two groups. So this, this word, in the decrees, it appears five times in the Bible. <coughs> The word means dogma. It does not mean decrees or commandments. Horrible translations. The word in Greek is dogma. And it's a decree or an edict. Okay, so in Luke 2.1, it was a decree from Caesar. 
In Acts 7.17, it was also a decree from Caesar. In Acts 16.2, it was the letter, this was the first general conference, Acts chapter 15, and it was the letter that the apostles wrote to the Gentiles. That was considered a decree. So this is clearly not talking about the commandments of God. Colossians 2.14, by canceling out the decrees that stood against us, this he has set aside, nailing it to the cross. Again, this is the fifth time that it's used. Not talking about the laws. It's talking about the written transgressions of us, the record of our sins. The victory that Satan had over us was nailed to the cross. And he was victorious over the demonic spirits. Ephesians 2, 13 and 19. He did this by ending the law of commandments expressed in decrees He made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles by creating in himself one new new people from the two groups. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death. And on the cross, our hostility towards each other was put to death. There's so much hostility that we believe in. Believing that there's hostility between you and another person creates the hostility. When you believe there's no hostility between you and another person, that paves the way for that to be reconciled and that to be true. He he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far off from him. And peace to the Jews who were near. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens of along with all of God's holy people, because we're brothers. You are members of God's family. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female, for all are one in Christ. Now there's lots of ways that we can pervert this text into meaning the submissiveness of a wife and all of the different ways the evangelical and many other people take this. Well, we're all equal now. All of that stuff's been done away with. No, that's not what it's saying. All humanity are equal in Christ. We're all equally saved. We all have access to the perfect righteousness, perfect justification. It doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, what color you are, what race you are, where you come from. We're all saved. We're all equal in Christ. This is the objective truth. Even if nobody believes it, it's still the truth. Because it is the objective truth of the Bible. Since we have now been justified by His blood, Romans 5, 9 and 10, this justified is in the aorist tense. The aorist tense is a past historical fact. So we have now been justified past historical fact by his blood, by his life, death, birth, life, death, and resurrection. One of my pet peeves, I just have to confess, is when I hear somebody say, oh, I was saved last week. I came to Christ and I I was saved last week. Mm, No, you weren't saved last week. You realized last week that you were saved 2,000 years ago by Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19 For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. For he has given us this wonderful message of reconciliation. That God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ephesians 2, 1, 10 through 12. <clears throat> that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, in Christ. In him also we have obtained the inheritance of being pre- uh, predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. His will is for all to be in heaven. That we who first trusted in Christ should be uh, should be to the praise of his glory. The union of the divinity 
signs of the times. The union of the divinity with divinity with humanity brings to the fallen race a value that we scarcely comprehend. The human and the divine are united in Christ. So it's not only us that are in Christ. We now have access to that divinity through Him. Not that we can become God, but we can become as we can walk in the victory that God walked for us. We can we can get the dominus, the power, the dynamite power from the Holy Spirit through this. The human and the divine were united in Christ in order that we might represent represent those who should believe in Him. He took our nature and passed through our experience. And as our representative, he assumed our responsibilities. He assumed our responsibilities. The sins of man were charged to Christ. We, we know double jeopardy is not legal, right? I mean, even our human standard of righteousness says that a person can't be condemned for the same sin twice. It would be unjust for us to be punished for the same sin twice unless we reject the gift that he's been given. As, as Lionel was saying, the gift, the wonderful gift, signs of the time. Innocent though he was, he engaged, he engaged to suffer for the guilty that through faith in him the world might be saved. Oh, what compassion and love are here revealed. How is humanity exalted through the merits of Christ? He sacrificed was ample and complete. The Holy One died instead of the unholy. He clothed Himself in our filthy garments that we might wear the spotless robe of His righteousness, which was woven in the loom of heaven. Justice. Let's talk about justice because this is something that this truth of in Christ touches on in a way that I have not seen anybody else touch on. Substitution is a word that's used in the Bible a lot for Christ, and He is our substitute. But the nuts and bolts of the gospel go much deeper than just a substitute. And a substitute is actually offensive to a lot of other religions that understand substitution is not justice. There's no court on the earth that will take a substitute. Even though Jeffrey Dahmer's mom said, I will die for him. No, no, that's not justice. That's not justice. And this truth goes right to the point of this. The law requires perfection in thought, word, and deed, or you die. You, we have both a negative and a positive side to righteousness and guilty. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. Romans 5.18 Consequently, as one, trust, as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Anybody know Richard Dawkins? He's one of the most famous atheists and evolutionists on the planet. He said, if God wanted to forgive our sins, why did he just not forgive them? Who's God, who is God trying to impress? Presumably himself, since he's judge, jury, and execution victim. If Trump ends up in jail, let's just say he ends up in jail... Would it be justice if Melania took his place? Said, oh, I'll go to jail. You, you can go free. Is, is that justice? No. no. No, it's not. The Muslims call the, the doctrine of substitution fictional justice. And it is. And it's biblical. Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent show, share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. Again, in the law, Deuteronomy 24, 16, it says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin alone. 
So this this idea of of substitution being legal is actually said said illegal in the scriptures. I'm not I'm not discrediting the the doctrine of substitution being spoken of all through the scriptures. But I'm saying the truth of the substitution is much deeper and more legal. Law requires my death, your death. You must die. Somebody can't die for you. So when we were born in Christ, this is where this implication comes from. When we were born in Christ, Christ was born, all humanity was born. So when Christ lived a perfect, youthful life, while I was a youth, and all of the youth here can have access to his perfect righteousness because you were in him being perfect as he was walking. His life and his death. We were in him. So if one died, all died. So all died. Once for all. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Again, it is because of him that you are created in Christ Jesus who has become to us wisdom from God that is our righteousness. Okay, so if the law requires us to die, the law would also require us to actually be righteous in order for us to get credit for that. We can't get somebody else's righteousness. My son's not going to go to... There are no grandkids in heaven, right? You're all children. We're all children. Well, when you reach the age of accountability. Romans three twenty-five. He did this, speaking of the faith of Christ, he did this, to demonstrate his righteousness because by overlooking the sins committed beforehand, unpunished, all the sins before the cross were overlooked through the sacrificial system and others. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the one who justifies the one of the faith of Jesus. So, with this doctrine of us being in Christ, God is just to forgive us because the punishment for the law has already been committed. The righteous requirement of the law has already been fulfilled. Therefore, God now has the legal right, the legal right to forgive us. And this is what Satan said he couldn't forgive us for because he's righteous. He can't just forgive us. But God is so much more brilliant. He is so much more brilliant. Love is just. So he, God is love. He can't just wipe it away. He has to actually get in and do it for us. And he did. Again, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to walk in. His righteous life is a gift to us. His Sabbath keeping, His obedience, His faith. But their minds were dull, for to this day the same veil lies over those who read the Old Covenant, or <clears throat> remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because it's only removed in Christ. Once we understand this concept that we actually have righteousness because of what Christ did, because we were in him, we actually have justification, we have holiness that we can receive by faith, real holiness, real righteousness, not just, not just our will. So what does this do? This really brings, this really does bring a freedom from the law. It, it really does bring a freedom from the law. But what I like, what I read, a story that I really like to share that gives, that gives the truth, that tells us the truth behind the heart, right? Because the new covenant is God's laws written on our heart, and I will forgive your sins. So those are the two things. Well, we've all seen the movies, or we've all heard the stories where somebody had diplomatic immunity, and they sped on purpose, and they did drugs, and they got into all the criminal activities because they're exempt. Right? Well, this behavior tells us something very important about their heart. Their heart is unconverted. Even though they have freedom, they're using it for an excuse for evil. But then on the other side, you can have diplomatic immunity and you can try to obey all the laws and you can do your best to do everything you can to be loyal to the government or to the God that you serve. 
but you're still free. And it's what it does is it reveals where your heart is. Has your heart been converted? Do you want to obey Him or do you not? Peter says it beautifully. Live as free people. Live as free people. Diplomatic immunity. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. This does not give us an excuse to be flagrant with His Word or easily dismiss His commandments. This, this truth, this truth should create a burning within us to be obedient to His will because of His amazing love and the feet that He has given us. This diplomatic immunity cannot be trampled. We cannot trample this immunity. We have to do all that we can to be in His glory and to honor Him. You know, one of the things I heard today in this beautiful song was how can I express a response of love for you? It's our free will obedience that we respond to Him in loving one another. It was not your choice to become a sinner, but it is your choice to stay one. And it says in Ephesians 1.13, You also, after listening to the truth, the message of the truth in Christ, the gospel of your salvation, having also trusted, so you heard it, now you need to trust it. And if you heard it and you believe it, you are saved.